Right, hello everybody, and um, and welcome to to June's edition of of the um, Agile Roundabout. Um, thank you for for joining us this month, and I hope you're all keeping well and enjoying the glorious British summer um, that that we're currently experiencing. And if if you like me, it's absolutely pissing it down at the moment. Um, so for for this month's event, we're going to be focusing on leadership and um, decision making within the workplace, and and to help us explore these two topics. Um, we've got two really good speakers lined up. So to, to introduce um, them, um, first we've, we've got James, who will give you a quick wave. He's, he's taking a sip of water. <laughs> um, he's, he's a senior delivery manager at, at Minecast. And, and then we've got Luke, who's a senior delivery manager at the F tea as well. So for all of you who, who don't know, my name's Jonathan and I run and, and host um, this particular meetup and we're part of a bigger brand called, called The Roundabouts. We've got some other great um, meetups um, within within that brand as well. Um, so if you haven't attended some of those, definitely recommend checking those out. So back to this evening, um, both speakers love your participation and interaction. So feel free to, to ask any any questions and in the comment section and at the end of, of both James's and Luke's talk we'll, we'll bring them both back and, and have a little bit of discussion and and obviously they'll they'll answer any questions that, that you have so right let's get on with with the talks so first up we'll be hearing from from James who will be um, talking about a very pertinent topic at the moment um internet-based leadership so James I'll, I'll let you take it from here thanks a lot thank you very much for having me so I thought to start off with, uh, just to introduce who I am and, and why I'm here. So, uh, as as uh, Jonathan mentioned, I'm James Drake. I uh, I work. Or I, I started my agile journey at uh, a number of tech companies, uh, Qualcomm, CSR, and Arm. And uh, the odd one out there is Wipro, which is hospitality. Uh, but I tend to stick to tech. And I, I actually realised as I was putting the slide together that all of the logos are blue, even the one I work at now. So, um, I'm currently at Mimecast, as as Jonathan mentioned. Um, where I do a bit of bit of everything. So I'm a Scrum Master, Delivery Manager, uh, Agile Coach, Mentor, um, and I get involved in various things where, where Agile is going on around the business. Um, and for those that don't know, Mimecast is a cloud-based email solution um, for Microsoft Exchange and O365. Uh, in, on a personal note, you can see me in a, a funny suit there. I, uh, I for my sins, did a, um, a, the London Marathon in a, in a horrible dog suit which was awful um, and painful at the time. I won't be doing that again, all my joints are knackered now. Um, I live in a, a, a small town called Biggleswade, just north of London. Uh, and I live there with my two pups and my uh, remaining girlfriend. It affords me some eclectic uh, dishes, that's for sure. So uh, if we move into um, intent-based leadership, which is hopefully why some of you are here. So intent-based leadership, what the hell is it? So intent-based le leadership, IBL, uh, is the fostering of a psychologically safe environment that allows people to freely contribute. And it gives people uh, the intent, oh, sorry, people are given the intent to one another so that they feel valued and that they're proud of their work. One of the foundations of IBL is about giving up control and the decision-making ability to those who maintain the information. So IBL emancipates leaders at all levels of, of an organization um, and success is shared by all. You may be wondering where IBL comes from. I don't know if uh, anyone else has heard of it. It was fairly new to uh, myself and some of the members of Mimecast about a year ago. Um, it comes from a, a chap called David Marquet. Um, you may be familiar with some of his books and some of his learnings. I know we've used some of it in past organizations in training. Um, but David was the uh, commander of a submarine in the US Navy called the USS Santa Fe, and he turned that submarine from one of the worst in the fleet to being one of the most successful by using a leader leader model of leadership. And he molded that system and what he learned on the, on the um, USS Santa Fe into a system that we now know as IBL. So why the hell am I talking about IBL at an Agile talk or an Agile event? So fund fundamentally, IBL and Agile share some significant and key similarities. IBL builds on Agile at Mindcut, sorry, Agile and fosters uh, an even better mindset and environment. It, it looks at trust, so in one another and investing in one another, respect. So we look at respecting everyone and fostering a psychologically envi safe environment to freely contribute, and it emancipates leaders at all levels. But also focus on, on that idea of servant leadership, so taking a step back and ensuring that, that leaders speak last to foster creativity and engagement. 
We also have a, the inspect and adapt mindset in terms of continuous improvement, um, in terms of how we lead and support those around us to grow. And just before I kick off into the main pack, I wanted to take a moment and, and talk about a bit of a word of credit for some of the people that helped us on this journey. So first off is uh, Matteo Manny. He's a director at Mindcast. He's, a, he's our resident IBL evangelist who brought the uh, IBL word of mouth to, to us and to the leaders. So massive thanks to him. Um, Remarkable, which was our, our partner in, in our journey, um, and specifically Kate Carmichael, who helped us and, and trained us in, in some of the, the fundamentals and some of the uh, key aspects that have helped us drive this forward. Intent-based leadership international, obviously, this is where a lot of the content and ideas come from. And then our other partner, which is uh, Basil Arden, who's our, who, who is and it's kind of con con continues to be our agile coach. Uh, he uh, comes from Ripple Rock. So moving into, so I could speak for hours on IBL, but unfortunately I only have a time box of 20 minutes, which is possibly fortunate for you guys. Um, so I think to start and maybe just to give you an idea, a bit more detail about what IBL is, I think the idea, the, the, the ideal is to just give you an idea of the six principles that make up um, intent-based leadership. So I will move into those and, and just give you a very quick overview. And given the time, I will have to move, move fast. So bear with me, just grab a sip of water. So the first principle is don't be good, get better. And what does that mean? Well, when we're in a, a be good mindset, we are looking to protect what we have. So that means that we're cautious, and generally, we're risk adverse. However, if we can move into a get better mindset, that generally means we're curious and we're looking for improvements. So how does how, how does and what does getting better look like? Well, there are some ideas on the board or on the slide there. But in general, we look at the ladder of leadership, which I'll talk about in a, in a few slides. But we're trying to move people up and grow them in our leadership ladder to help them get better by increasing their range of language, of perspective, and empowering them. We look at inspection and adaption. So instead of asking people to fail early, we ask them to validate something early. For example, we, we look at a spike or a POC, and then we use the insights from that outcome. Uh, we look at feedback. So we invite or seek feedback on how to improve. And additionally, we invite additional perspectives and options, focusing on that continuous improvement loop. And there are some ideas here on how we actually get better. So we, we ensure that we're thinking long term and not just for the moment. We're curious. We're trying things differently. We're emancipating those around us. Uh, we embrace inspectors. So we, we encourage feedback and we learn everywhere all the time. Okay, so this, the uh, second principle is leaders making it safe and not adding stress. People generally perform better in an environment that feels safe. Hopefully we can all agree on that. As leaders, we can all do our part to make sure our environment is safe to think, it's safer to suggest new ideas and be creative, also safer to make mistakes and learn from those mistakes. One of the key aspects of IBL is that leaders speak last. So we hold back and hear other people's perspectives so that they can be curious and not compelling in terms of our in our thoughts. We avoid anchoring the conversation and we, gen to, we, we tend to anchor conversations by uh, intention or not by speaking first. So there's a fine line between not speaking at all. This is something I, I had a bit of a challenge with learning at first was, if I wait too long to speak, does that mean I'm not engaged? So there's a fine line between waiting until uh, everyone else has had their say and then, then speaking at the end, there's not speaking at all. So something to consider. If we uh, are trying to find out some feedback from a group, um, instead of anchoring an opinion, we can do some unanchored voting. So. We may use a fist of five, for example. There's lots of techniques, but a fist of five is one technique to check how comfortable people are and how confident people are with a decision or an idea. If we look at dissent, so we encourage dissent. So we re resist the urge to reach an early consensus. We want to make sure we get more ideas, more points of view across, and the information's heard, um, which results in better decisions in general. On the right hand side, you can see that I've, I've written some examples down here, or this is some of the content from IBL. So, so these are the seven deadly sins of questioning. The first one is around stacking or question stacking. This tends to uh, shut people down and it will end up frustrating them. So we try and avoid that. So ask one question first, move on to the next instead of question stacking, obviously. Um, we don't want to do lead, lean questions, which are clearly bad, but be, be curious. Why questions? They can be provocative. So we want to be 
curious about some of the questions we ask around, tell me more about something or what makes you think that. We want to avoid dirty questions, look out for bias you're introducing when you ask dirty questions and, and be very careful to focus on clean language. Um, Self-affirming questions, so that make, for example, that makes sense, right, or we're all set. You know, those, those are self-affirming leading questions that can, that can have a, a damaging effect and shut people down very quickly. And then lastly is the aggressive type of questions that can trigger defensiveness. Think about a pause, rewind, and fast forward mindset when you're asking these questions. So for example, in a pause, you're inviting observation. For example, what do you see? Rewind, how did we get there? What happened before this? And fast forward, what should we do? Uh, next slide. So pu pu uh, pushing authority to information is the uh, is, is the third principle. So um, the, so this is around so giving control and authority for the people who are maintaining the information because they have much more detailed knowledge. So by giving them the authority and emancipating them, we enable better decisions, reduce the need for approval and, and any delays. Plus, we're hopefully increasing motivation as well. This principle also reduces bottlenecks and any stress that that may cause that can arise from leaders having to be in every decision. So there are, there are some key kind of points I wanted to raise here. So one is certifying, not, not briefing. So employees talking through next steps and explaining what it is, what their intent is and what they intend to do. Uh, and with a manager or a coworkers, just certifying that they're ready to proceed. And again, these, these conversations can have differing levels of types of questions, depending on where people are on a leadership ladder. Uh, as I mentioned, we'll, we'll talk about that in just a moment. Flipping the ownership and, and ch changing that power gradient. So how, how do we do that? So team members can lead on discussions. Uh, t uh, leaders listen and only speak when everyone's shared their thinking. Leaders don't necessarily have the information, uh, actually not necessarily, leaders don't have information that others don't have. Uh, leaders don't automatically chair the meeting and that they strive to get commitment, not coercion. Return problems unsolved. This might sound a bit counterintuitive, but it's really important for development of those around you. So listening to an employee's problem and, and, and hearing through what they think the best thing is for them to do is, is most important in, in inviting them to share their views and ideas of how to fix it. So asking them probing questions and curious questions, you know, using that healthy language could really help them unblock themselves and bring about that real that real change in terms of uh, legal, uh, language. The other part here I've got is the Andon cord. So some of you may be familiar with the Andon cord. It was first used in Toyota, and it was used to stop the production line if anyone saw a problem. So the question here is making sure that your teams or squads have the authority and feel safe enough to stop working on something important if they feel they have identified a problem that is important enough to stop work on something that's high priority. So do your people have the authority and accountability for raising issues and stopping activity if they find something significant. Uh, and just a point here on here is um, the technical competence, do they have the skills to ex execute and the organizational clarity is understanding the impact priorities and, and knowing that it's the right thing to do. Okay, uh, so tuning control is, is the fourth principle. Um, obviously, there's a couple of graphs here, which is going to take. It's, in a normal way, in a normal kind of session, it would be a lot easier to do over a longer period of time. But given the time constraint, let me talk through these fairly qu quickly. So, tuning the levels of control. People spend a lot of their time either frustration or chaos if you're not fine tuning the level of the control that they have based on their competence and their clarity of what they should be doing. So, assessing individuals on a one-to-one -one basis where they should be in terms of how much control that they should be given based on how much competence and clarity they have of the problem. Um, so if you give too much control and they don't have competence and clarity, they end up in a chaos zone because they have too much control and they don't know what to do with it. But if you give too little control, but they have the competence and clarity to get to make an act, in a, and enact change, they end up in this fr frustration zone. So it's finding that fine balance. Uh, and as the quote says, clarity comes from understanding the why. Uh, the other diagram you can see here is this CS, sorry, C3PO model, which is not anything to do with Star Wars. Uh, it translates to the um, control competence and clarity people organization. Um, so when someone is lacking one of the three Cs, which is control, clarity, competence, 
an organization's activity will not be optimized. And what you might find is you may find that if you have a misaligned activity that can result in a lack of clarity, a, mistake, uh, a mistaken activity can result in a lack of competence, and inactivity might just be that there is a lack of control. So tuning control is based on someone's um, competence and clarity is, is really key. So on to the ladders of leadership I mentioned um, a few slides ago. Um, every, every, every time someone comes to you and says, tell me what to do, resist that urge. Don't tell them what to do. Now, where you go exactly from there depends on where they are in their journey and where you are in the context of the situation. So start from the bottom up. Focus, people, focus on moving people up the ladder one rung at a time. Um, it may take a while to get someone up one rung and they may slip back, but don't be disheartened. It's dynamic and context specific, but you can see the left and the right hand side diagram here with the manager may say, you know, at level one, I'll tell you what to do. Obviously this isn't where we want to be. We want to be kind of at the intention and above. So level five, what, what do you intend to do? And a worker coming to you to say, I intend to do X. Um, is that the right thing to do is the uh, would potentially be the reply from the manager. So a lot of it is around um, language and assessing where an individual is on the ladder of this leadership model and helping them achieve the next level is significant. It really is significant for an organization's ability to grow and improve. So the fifth principle is uh, fixing the environment. So we need to ensure that people have the right tools that they need to do their job. Um, and this is the key, I should have mentioned this at the start, leaders fix the environment, not the people. So if there are problems, first think about if it's the environment that's the problem, instead of someone not being able to fulfill something. So do they have the tools that they need to be able to be successful? Is their working environment healthy and conducive to helping them improve and grow? Is there a structure in place to encourage their growth and freedom to contribute? And do they feel safe to express their views and ideas in a safe place? And some of the techniques are, you know, they're on screen. So thinking out loud by building transparency and trust by sharing, making the invisible visible. So sharing your thought process when assessing a problem, specifying goals, not methods, driving alignment and autonomy. One sum all is the idea of starting with some individual focused time to think about things, ideate, and then coming into a small group to discuss those with a smaller subset, maybe like a trio. And then finally, coming back as a big group to discuss the ideas that you started with and eventually got to with a smaller group and then share those. Having that once or more really helps to uh, allow people to, to, to think about things um, and speak up because it, it can be difficult in a large group. So thinking about the environment and how we can make people feel safe to share their, their, what they want to share and, and contribute. So the, the last uh, principle is actual way to new thinking. Um, and again, a quote here, researcher Wendy Wood found that 40% of the decisions we make every day aren't decisions, they are habits. Um, and that might take us on nicely to uh, Luke's chat next. Um, so developing leadership ability requires sub the subtlest of changes to behavior and habits. Uh, leaders use language to act their way into new thinking and change the environment. So think of a cue and then a routine and then a reward. Um, and try tiny habits to evolve that behavior. So find the trigger, what, what was the location? What time did it happen? How did you feel? Were there anyone else, was there anyone else involved? And what happened afterwards? What, and then what can you apply as a micro habit? It doesn't have to take you know, half an hour or something. It, can be, it should be very quick and easy to implement and then repeat it. You're likely to see mistakes, learn from them, inspect and adapt, be mindful and then celebrate that you've changed something. So last, so that's the end of the principles. So given what I've told you in a very whirlwind talk, I'd like to invite you to try giving up control. So I did have a, a work-based giving up control and a personal-based giving up control, um, but I I'll focus on the personal. So consider giving up control and then see what happens as a result. So you can try some ideas. So here are some examples that we took from, from Remarkable and Kate. Um, which which were interesting. Um, if you've got someone to pick out your clothes of what you'll wear to, uh, tomorrow, for example, at an important meeting, especially if you've got children or something, it can be an interesting one. So think about if you can give up control, if you're willing to try it and what impact that had and how it made that person feel that was, that was taking control. 
I did just have some recommendations I wanted to share with you as well. I think we're okay for the time at the moment. So the recommendations I have, so if, you, if you've kind of liked what you've heard around IBL and how it can help your agile environments, I'd strongly recommend heading over to Intent-Based Leadership International. There's a lot of free resources on there where you can find out more. Also, you know, if you want to have a chat, I'm more than happy to have a chat about um, further kind of developing and, and what that means. I would also strongly recommend our partner at Remarkable. They were fantastic with our engagement. They uh, are very much recommended. Um, and some books. So the first two, obviously, David Marquez, which are, are significant. So if you haven't read those, at least take a look. They've got their, they're very highly rated. So Turn the Ship Around is, is David's first book out of the two. And then Leadership is Language is, is the most recent, which is really important. And it, it ties nicely into IBL. A couple of the other books are, are similar and, um, and, and also unrelated. So The Motive by, uh, by Patrick is a, it's about reward, it's about reward-based leadership and also um, responsibility-based leadership. So the, the two types of leadership in an organization, um, it's actually quite a short book. I got through it in a couple of hours, really, really recommended. Um, and a completely different kind of type of book was by Mark Ransom, The Subtle Art of Not Giving A, and I won't say that word, but fantastic book and some, some great thinking there. So just in the last few minutes, because I finished earlier than I thought I would, I do have a last slide to just talk you through, which is still on the subject of IBL, which is encouraging thinking. So don't get stuck in the, the now. Also look at the future. So imagine where we're going to be in six to 12 months from now. Uh, where do you wish, what do you wish we had tried or done differently? Um, swap perspectives. So be curious and ask people around you. If they're asking for help or advice or, or to solve a problem, First, maybe ask them, what do you think I would do? Or what do you think we should do? In true agile style, break things down so it's easier to start. Don't do th things that are too big, batch things down, get things across the line in MVP style. Resist that urge, as I mentioned earlier, don't jump in and solve problems. Give people time to work it out, produce a solution, uh, explain their thinking, ideate, and then speak last. This one's a bit controversial. Be late to meetings. This I, I feel two ways about this. It's good and bad, but by being late to your own meeting, it, and I, I wouldn't suggest doing it all the time. Be late and see what happens with it without you there. Do, does the meeting start? Can people start without you? Can they start having a important discussion without you anchoring a conversation, for example? So consider not all the time, but turning up a few minutes late to see if the meeting kicks off. To see if meaningful conversation is, is able to continue without you being present um, and see what impact that has. Uh, and that about wraps up my slides, I think, which is almost a minute from time, which is handy. <laughs> thank you. Thank you very much, um, James. And, and lots of lots of good things to, to, to think about there. And um, I've got, um, being, being an ex-teacher, especially around um, growth mindset, I've, I've got a few questions, which I'm looking forward to, to asking you about that. But um, we'll, we'll, next, we'll, um, we'll hear from, from um, Luke, who's, who's going to be talking more about decision making. So Luke, I'll, I'll let you take it away now. Great. Thanks, all. Um... That was a great talk, James. And I just want to say David Marquet's book, I think, is absolutely fantastic. And I really think everyone should go away and read it. I say it's one of the few workbooks which I've really found inspiring, but I actually actively wanted to read when I got home. But moving on, so I'm going to be talking about improving decision making, uh, mainly with using agile principles, but also lessons learned from one of my favorite films, which is Danny Boyle's film Sunshine, came out in 2007. I should also state this is about making decisions rather than about making better decisions. Um, making better decisions would be a totally different talk and we'd be there for a long, long time. So bear with me a little bit longer. So I think this is a fact. The internet tells me it is a fact, but we should be making 30, approximately at least, 35,000 decisions a day, okay? So it's about 2,000 decisions per hour. I must say, I'm a little bit dubious, but if this is true, I cannot verify how they work this out or what constitutes decision. Does like looking directly down the camera on a Zoom call, so it looks like you're making eye contact with people on the other end, count as a decision. Uh, does not picking your nose on a Zoom call count as a decision? Does you know having chocolate sprinkles and your cappuccino, you know, do all these add up? Does uh, you know choosing the same coloured socks to go to work does that count as a decision? But even if they're you know thirty thousand decisions they have wrong, right? Five thousand decisions a day is still a hell of a lot. Um, so we're going to talk about what else we can do about that. So I appreciate this is kind of a one-way conversation currently, but I would bet money that everyone has encountered this problem. Okay. So I'm sure we've all been in a meeting. It's lasted for three hours. Yeah, it's gone on and on and on. 
And you realize at the end of it, that not a, a single decision was actually made, except for one decision. And that one decision was to have another meeting about making the decision. Okay? So, you may have heard of this man. You may not have done, but you probably heard of some of his work. So, it was a guy called Cyril Northcott Parkinson. Um, he wrote something called The Law of Triviality in 1957. Um, a couple, one of the ones you probably most definitely heard of is that work expands, so to fit the time available for its completion, uh, which I think if you've ever worked in projects, you know that to be oddly true. But uh, the one I want to talk about today and what's most relevant to us is that people, the time spent on any item of the agenda will be in inverse proportion to the sum of money in this case involved. So that means, you know, if we've got a 10 million pound decision to make, we won't spend all of our time talking about it we will spend a significant amount of our time talking about what coffee we should have or how good the biscuits are. And obviously that's lovely, but we've got this huge decision to make we're spending all our time on, but instead we're spending a disproportionate amount talking about something of relatively small significance. And this term is kind of often referred to as bike shedding. Okay. So bike shedding, I'll cover this off very quickly. So Again, this came from uh, Cyril Northcott Parkinson, but the idea behind it was that if you were building a nuclear power station, right, the design committee, you know, would spend a huge amount of time talking about where to put the bike shed rather than where to put the reactor, right? Obviously, they still talk about where to put the reactor, but as we said before, they would spend a disproportionate amount of time talking about the bike shed and where it should be, okay? All sorts of reasons for this, right? Okay, firstly, and probably most damagingly, and I think what pertains to you know our conversations in the real world most of the time is the fact that a bike shed is easy to understand, right? And if something is easy to understand, it means everyone, even me, I can have an opinion on it, right? And if I have an opinion on it, it means I want my opinion to be heard, which can really, really slow down decision making. Also, you know, why we sometimes kind of drag on things like bike sheds or simple decisions is because they're safe, right? You know, what color the mugs are going to be in your new office probably isn't that big a deal, right? But it's quite a safe decision. So you might spend a lot of time working on that compared to how many desks you're going to have or how many toilets you're going to have or how much you spend on the Wi-Fi. Also, you know, I'm a real sucker for this. You know, I love a to-do list, being a delivery manager. And also, it's nice to get something easy that you can tick off on your to-do list and feel like you've made progress instantly. Uh, but most importantly, possibly after that, is it's a displacement activity. Right. By doing this, it gives us a sense that we're getting something done and it means we can procrastinate and worry about this and not worry about the huge multi-billion decision we've actually got to make about where to put our nuclear power plant. Also, something else that makes decision making hard is loss aversion. Um, yeah, anyone who's been in the stock market is probably very, very used to this. Um, but it's a simple premise that we feel losses far more than we do gains. Right. Luckily, I found this lovely little graph to demonstrate that. But, you know, so if I made, you know, a thousand pounds, right, that's lovely. You know, I should feel really good about that. But if I lost a thousand pounds, I would feel that more than twice as much. I'd feel the damage more than twice as much as I felt the gain. Okay. So that naturally makes us risk averse. Um, and if we risk averse, you know, and we are always going to be at certain times and, you know, certain moments in our life when we will be risk averse, um, it just makes it harder to make decisions again. Okay. Also, I'm going to go through all the reasons why we struggle to make decisions, but I'm hoping to throw some solutions at you after this, okay? So I recommend reading up about these. They are obviously in-depth, deep psychological views with research behind them. Um, I'm kind of just going to cover them extremely, extremely briefly. Okay, so the status quo bias, right? I imagine we've all probably heard of this in some capacity. In fact, if anyone has ever said to you when you're getting a new boss or something else big is happening at work, is like, better the devil you know, right? And it's status quo bias, okay? So it's kind of a concept that things could be terrible. They could be awful. Your boss could be an absolute tyrant, but you're used to it, right? You know you can survive it to a certain degree. So people kind of say, oh, better the devil you know, you know, just put up with it because what you could get could be worse, right? So if you change something, it could be worse. So again, this makes us a little bit adverse to change or making a decision. Decision inertia. Okay, so this is when we kind of struggle to you know, actually make a single choice and then commit to it. Okay, so what we'll often have, we'll have loads of options. We think we made a decision, but we haven't really. 
we kind of keep going back to it. We keep all of our options open and we just kind of wind down the clock again and again and again. Um, this often happens when we've got loads of options, like this poor guy in the little, little cartoon there, when he's got about 40 different options, right? It gets hard to choose. Um, that's when we normally see them as all having bad or negative consequences. So we kind of just don't make a decision. We just kind of sit there and freeze and struggle. And we've all heard of fear of missing out, at least I believe we have, but um, I want to talk about FOBO. Um, it was also coined by Patrick McGuinness, who coined the fear of missing out. Um, but this is the fear of a better option. So again, it's, you know, it feeds on from decision inertia, but it's when you keep holding out from making a decision in the hope that something, you know, some Hail Mary is going to fall from the sky and it's going to solve all your problems and it'll be the perfect thing. So you don't really have to make a hard decision because this wonderful, glorious thing is going to come in and make everything better. Okay, so I think if you have personally ever experienced where people are kind of struggling to commit to your idea, or hell, you know, coming for a night out, coming for a drink, right? If you've ever been, you know, someone keeps just leading you on a little bit and you're kind of like, you're there waiting and they're like, oh, I might be here later, I might be here later. That is fear of other option, right? They are waiting to see if something better will happen, okay? So, and then finally, emission bias. OK, this is often highlighted most in the very grim trolley experiment where a trolley is kind of coming down the tracks and there's a group of people on one end of the tracks, a group of people on the other tracks. And you are stood there and you have the power to change the trolley's direction. OK, and you choose whether it's going to hit one person or five people. Um, apart from that being quite morbid, I also think it kind of defeats a point of emission bias, which is it kind of turns into a mathematical equation, which I think makes the decision too easier. Because, you know, if you had a choice between, I don't know, let's say buildings instead, if you have a choice between trashing five buildings and one building, you'd probably choose one building, okay? So it becomes simple numbers, right? But emission bias is, I think, a lot deeper about it. And this is that society, we tend to not blame people if they don't make a decision, okay? Maybe that's justified because, as we said, decisions are hard. We struggle with decisions, okay? But it is the tendency to favor an act of emission or inaction over one of action. So I personally believe more than anything, I think we see this in politics, right? And we're not going to talk about politics because that's you know, a way to get down. But I find if you kind of watch politicians a lot, you'll find that a lot of the time they don't make a decision. They kind of just wait and wait and wait until decisions slowly run out and they have less and less decisions to make. And they get to a certain point when there's only one decision left to make. And so they choose that decision. And if it goes horribly wrong, they kind of say things like, well, that was the only decision open to me. So I had to go with that one. And people will often be like, yeah, that's true. They only had that option available to them. Whereas if they had made the decision you know, two years earlier or whatever, they had more options. So we kind of just sit there and because there's not as much stake to not making a decision. Because if you make a decision and it's horrendous, you are personally culpable for that. Where if you don't make a decision at all, people can be a bit gentle with you. Okay. Right. So that's great, Luke. But um, what the hell can we actually do about it? So hopefully some of these things will actually help you. So um, I think one of the best things about Agile ever, and I find the most useful thing, the thing whenever I'm with my teams or working with people in business who don't do Agile, it's all I talk about. The first thing I talk to them about. And that is visualizing decisions. You know, I think before, you know, we had Agile, one of the biggest struggles we had was, you know, we kind of kept our project plans hidden. You know, we kind of keep in a document, the project manager would look after them. We wouldn't share them except for specific bits and kind of track it in a weekly meeting or a monthly meeting. And, you know, when we kind of agile, we started working in kind of scrum, Kanban boards, and this opened up everything, right? All of a sudden, the work was visual, right? We could see it. We could know what was happening. We could see what was blocked. We could see what was in progress. We could see what we had to do next. We could see what was done a lot easier, right? And we could just move things around, and it just made it. We could get it up on a board. You could have it digitally. Now the pandemic is all digital, right? But, you know, we had flexibility, right? But the point was it was visualized. So um, why don't we do that with decisions? Right. You know, I find decisions are often still this kind of opaque thing where, you know, we don't mark them down. We just kind of think, oh, we've got to do that. You know, like I reckon um, if you look through a lot of work you were really struggling with, your teams are struggling to get off the ground. I reckon a quite a large number of them will be because you are waiting on someone to make a decision about it. Somewhere on the lines, you kind of wait for money, you're waiting for the go ahead, you're waiting for someone to be signed off. Right. So I would suggest you visualize them. Right, because also again, it, it takes the pressure off yourselves and your teams. It says, "Hey, look, we have this decision to be made, and currently it is blocked. So we need help." 
right? Exactly the same with visualizer, other blockers, or other things that would get in the way of our teams. So I think there's three ways of doing this. I have a preference. So I personally like to have a decision swim lane, as you can see the first one. You can't see where I'm pointing, obviously. But um, I, so when I work with my teams, I like to have a whole decision swim lane. So every time, you know, we have a decision, add a label to it, up it pops to the top, top of the ball. We have decisions we are waiting on or decisions we have to make this sprint or this week. Okay. Alternatively, I'll come back to the guy who first put me onto dips, which I think is genius, um, is having a decision in progress, right? Yeah, in Kanban, we talk about work in progress, which of course is fantastic. You know, having work in progress limits gets things to done quicker, right? So why can't the principle for decisions be the same? Right, well, we kind of go back to kind of our decision inertia that I was talking about earlier. Okay, one of the things that can hit us is we've got hundreds of decisions coming at us at all the time. We've got all oh, 35,000 decisions a day to make, plus whatever else we've got to do, you know. So we get decision fatigue and it gets hard, it's tough, and it takes it out of us, and it grinds us down. So, you know, push that aside and just look and be like, okay, what decisions do we need to make first? Okay, what are the decisions that we need to make? And choose how many decisions you should maybe have open at any one time. You know, consider doing that and be like, hey, we're going to have a decision in progress limit of two. You know, until we make one of those decisions, we're not making any others. You know, be interesting, be bold. Or you can just highlight them, you know, on your board. You can make them a different color. You can give them a flag. Um, you know, I've made this one kind of, you know, yellowy, stuck a flag on it. You know, you can highlight them however you want. Um, as I said, I, I like just having it on the swim lane, but I generally think who I'll mention who I got the decision in progress off in a moment, but I think it's bloody brilliant. So I'm um, talking about the guy who came up with decision in progress. That's actually a guy called John Clapham. Um, I saw him talking at the Lean Agile Exchange. I'll share, I think the guy might be a genius. So I'll, I'll try and share his details after this. Um, but he also shared this thing, which I thought was brilliant. I think it should be shared more widely. Um, and it was about agreeing consent levels with your team. Okay. So, you know, we're obviously lovely, cuddly people, and that's great, right? You know, it's good. We want we want to work with nice people. We want to be good. But we often find, I believe, we, I find anyway, that we want consensus on things. We want everyone to agree, which is a wonderful ideal and something really positive to try and achieve, right? But it's also really hard, right? To get everyone to agree to something is very challenging. So you can kind of use this, you know, this graph, you know, kind of this, this little box here to think about what level of consent or consensus you need for any big decisions, right? So, you know, do you actually need wholehearted endorsement? Do you need everyone involved to 100% agree with that decision, you know? Or are they allowed to have reservations and, you know, you can just keep them to yourselves, you know? Or alternatively, and I find I do this as a delivery manager um, a lot, so I'm, I'm not technical. I'm not the technical expert, right? Uh, my colleagues are. So I find when we're making a technical decision, I abstain. I do not weigh it in because, frankly, it, I'm, I don't have the expertise. It is none of my business, which I'll come back to a little bit later. You know, what I care about is we make a decision and we can progress the work. That's what I care about. Whereas the actual what they're going to do is possibly someone else's decision to make. OK, and I'll just be there probably to write down the actions and record it. And obviously tick off that our decision has been made on my board. Then, of course, you get into more things. But just always think about when you're having a meeting with your team, right? Do you need 100 percent consensus or do you just need consent? You know, do you just need a 60% majority? You know, but just have this discussion with your teams and just think about, hey, where where on this spectrum do you think we need to be for this decision? You know, can we be a little bit looser? Is it not that contentious? You know, do we just need, you know, a simple majority to continue it forward? And obviously, you know, I think we do some of this more than you would realize automatically. Like at the, at the bottom, we've got, you know, veto. And that feels like a really bad thing. But if you think you're organizing a team night out, right, you don't force anyone to go to a restaurant where they're allergic to it. You know, you'd automatically give that person a veto. So I think a lot of this stuff you would do automatically. It's just a way of formalizing and thinking about a business perspective where, hey, do we need 100% consent on every decision we need to make? And this could potentially allow us to make faster decisions or not so much faster, but actually get decisions made, right? I think there's a few things worse than when you're trying to get a proposal signed off and it just kind of kicks around for three months while you wait people to finally agree to it. So... Decisions in meetings. Okay, I honestly recommend this. Make time for decisions, right? And what do I mean by that? I mean, when we go back to our bike shedding thing, nothing else on the agenda, right? If you have a big decision to make, that should be the only item on the agenda, right? Don't give people a chance to talk about something else, 
to derail it, to kind of bike shed about anything else. Of, oh, what about this other thing we've got to think about? No, we talk about that one thing. Okay. And this is one for everyone, everyone on this call who's ever in a, a conversation about decisions, right? Keep drawing attention back to the decision that you are talking about. Okay. You know, and it's, it's very easy. You know, we want, you know, we start derailing things, you know, things get a little bit out of hand. We start having a general chat and all of a sudden we're talking about something that is completely irrelevant. I don't mean, you know, general chat, like, how are you? How's the family? Yeah. I'm talking about, oh, you know, have you seen what we got that problem or we have that incident? No. If you're there, you should be focusing on the decision, right? And it's up to all of us, you know, to kind of keep drawing attention back to that decision. And here we go. Number three, if decision is made, right, we've got to commit to it. Um, I think there's a few things more damaging than when you're in the meeting room, everyone commits and says, okay, yes, we're going to do this thing. We've made this decision. We're going to do it. And then the next day you come in and you realize that, no, people didn't actually mean that, and you're back to decision one. Okay, so if everyone's committed, you've got to fall through to it. Yeah, I'm not saying we have to do it forever, but you at least got to test it, right? You know, part of Agile is always about kind of proving our hypotheses and having, a, you know, something we can actually use. Yeah, if we never even kind of make that decision or try it, then how are we, look, how are we going to learn? How are we going to learn if it was a good decision or a bad decision? Okay. Number four is make decisions explicit. And I mean crazy explicit, like super explicit, super liminal explicit. So explicit, there is no way anyone could leave that room or that hangout and not know that you made a decision and everyone agreed to it. Okay, I mean, I've, I'm sure it's happened to all of you. I've been in a meeting once when I had to ask five times if somebody actually wanted me to do something. And they were so non-committal. By the time I left the meeting, I had no idea. I still didn't know if they wanted me to take an action on it. And that's very frustrating because then you do something and you find out it's the wrong thing, right? So really explicit, you know, when I kind of do my actions, I like to have a whole column just for decisions above actions, you know? So what my actions do for decisions, what decisions have we made? Make it public for everyone. I share it, you know, share it on the board. I share it, you know, in our notes while we're live on the screen while we're doing it. Okay. And proportional decision making. Okay. So think about how much money it costs you to be in a room making a decision. Yeah. If a decision is, you know, 30 quid, like who's going to pay this invoice? It's 30 quid for this invoice. And it's like, possibly who cares, you know? Um, I appreciate there's probably some accountancy challenges there, but also the point is like, it's probably cost you more question, more money in a business perspective to answer that question and ask it, answer it, rather than it would be just to pay it. Okay, so kind of, I've heard about a few people who've had, um, you know, like a counter in the corner, a clock that was set up and it tells you how many, you put how many people you've got in the meeting room and it tells you how much it's costing you per minute. And I'm not saying, we, you know, obviously we need meetings, we need to get together and make decisions, but if, you know, it's only a 200 pound decision, maybe just flip a coin on it because it'd be, you know, it doesn't matter, you know, it could be a lower priority than anything else. And you spend your time somewhere else better working on bigger decisions, perhaps. Um, and a final thought on this bit, just to kind of remember is, that as long as we are considering options and alternatives, right, we're not really committed, and we've not really made a decision. So, you know, um, there's a, oddly, there's a wonderful talk, I think, by Arnold Schwarzenegger, uh, where he talks about hating plan B. So worth, worth checking that out. Okay, so I mentioned Danny Boyle's Sunshine, which I, I generally think is criminally underrated. Okay, um, if I had time in this talk, I would literally play this film for you. Um, so I generally, once a month at least, I think about this film when we have to make a decision. Okay, so please do go and check it out. It's also got a wonderful um, example of um, consent-based decision-making in the film as well. So I think it's fantastic, right? So very quickly, very scene setting. I'm not going to take you through the whole film, but on a spaceship, incident happens. People have to make a decision on what we're going to do next. And this exchange happens, right? So two of the characters, there's a guy called Mace, who is like one of the engineers, one of the astronauts, a guy called Searle, who is the uh, psych officer, the psychology officer or psychiatrist, and then a guy called Kaneda, who is the captain. And they, I've highlighted what I think is most important things about this, right? So you know, we'll have a vote, okay, no, no, we won't. And I always think this is key, we're not a democracy, right? And I don't mean that in a negative way at all, like everyone's opinion matters. But at the same point, it shouldn't necessarily be a leadership decision, okay? So I don't mean that we're not a democracy from we should listen to the king or the queen, right? It's about who is actually knows what they're talking about. You know, if you've got a technical decision to make, you know, you wouldn't ask finance how to fix it, right? So think about who is in the room, who do you need to make this decision? And that comes to the next point. The first one, I think, the most informed decision available to us. Right. So 
who in the room can actually make the most informed decision, who can make the best possible decision because they know the information, they know what they should do, right? Yeah, you might have me in there, I might know nothing, but because I'm quite chatty, people are like, ah, oh, well, listen to Luke, right? No, no. Often the most informed person might be the quietest person in the room. So think who has the skills to make the most informed decision? And there's the final thing the captain says, the person best qualified, right? And so I often think we don't do this. I think, you know, we often, you know, succeed to the loudest person in the room and we shouldn't. You know, we should kind of look at who can make the best decisions for us. We should kind of empower them to do it, okay? Um, David Marquet, I think, will actually touch on a lot of this stuff if you read his book, so please do check that out as well. Um, one kind of final point on this, and before we go to my very last slide, but something, um, and it's also a shameless plug for the FT as well, and our, you know, our good old journalism. So um, there was a wonderful article by a guy called Dave Lee, one of our journalists, called The Amazon Machine, right? And he had this quote that really jumped out at me from someone who worked with Bezos, and he was saying about Amazon, the quote was, we call it the invention machine. Amazon could make decisions when Jeff was not in the room, okay? And obviously, you know, the success of Amazon is down to all sorts of reasons, and, you know, we're not really here to talk about Amazon. But ever since really made quite, I've often wondered, you know, is, is it really so much the invention machine, or have they just created a decision-making powerhouse that allows them to take action and achieve things? So kind of just keep that in mind, please. And finally, um, to kind of continue my theme, I'm now making a decision here to end this presentation. Um, but here's just some inspiring quotes. To kind of leave you at the end so uh thanks so much for for letting me jabber on and uh i'll hopefully answer some questions all in a minute okay thank you cool thank you thank you luke and um yeah be before that um thank you thank you james um so be before we obviously move on to, to questions um which uh, from from the audience and and if you two got any questions um for, for each other um we'll explore them but um yeah i just had a one or two questions for you, for you both to to start off with so um starting off with um with with James, um, pre talking about um, fixed versus growth mindset. So um, I don't know if you've ever um, looked at any of the work of, of Carol Dweck um, before on, on on mindset. But I was, I was going to ask, in, in in your opinion, what's what's the biggest barrier to, to transitioning from a fixed mindset to to a growth mindset? And and a complementary question for that: um, what, what do you think companies can can do to to better promote that that transition from a fixed to growth mindset? So I think the first part is about accepting an accept uh, a suitable amount of risk. Um, so being open and, and not risk adverse to trying new things, and and you know it's about seeking feedback and mm -hmm. and and trying to do things that aren't just the same. Uh, I think organisations can, you know, really foster that by creating that psychologically safe environment, which allows people to try new things, that people don't have to be you know feel fearful. If they try something and they fail, then they're going to get persecuted for it. They need to be able to be given the freedom and um, the ability to to contribute and try try new things. And um, yeah, that's that's basically it. Be, the organisation being being willing to give people the freedom to do that. Cool. And 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 for for Luke. Um, uh, Obviously, the, the, the pandemic um, changed changed a, a lot of things. So, would you say, in in terms of working remotely, and, and you mentioned about making decisions based on on a consensus, has has working remotely made us um, more or less decisive? Would you say? I personally think it's made us worse. Um, I think, um, and, you know, that's that's always going to happen, right? And that's that's okay. Like life's weird right now, so it's cool. Sure. You know, stuff's going to be strange, but. I find it's far easier to hide now than it was historically. Um, and don't get me wrong, I'm be working from home a lot more now, you know, even after the pandemic's over. But it's kind of things like, you know, if you share a document now and you want approval for it, you mm -hmm. know, before you'd put it up on a screen and you kind of take everyone through it, right? Mm -hmm. And be like, hey, good, do you agree? Do you agree? Do you agree? Sure. Whereas uh, that's a little bit more challenging now. So I personally believe it's got slower. Um, I think it's taken us longer now to make decisions. Um, plus, you know, <laughs> does there, if anyone actually read it, <laughs> very very true right so just before we we, we got to um, one or two questions from from the audience i just thought i'd open it up to, to, to you guys in case you had any questions for for, for one another or, or any points um so firstly um we'll, we'll go um um luke in terms of james's talk on on intent-based leadership did, did you have any questions or, or comments you, you thought were quite um, relevant? i do i mean there's one i don't think we might be able to get into it now but i always think um 
because I think intent-based leadership is fascinating. Um, I, I think David Marquet is an incredibly inspiring guy. But um, I don't know if you can cover it now, James, but I often think how do you get people to adopt it is the thing I'd be really interested in. Um, it's yeah. a tricky one. It's uh, it's behavioral and, you know, you have to start at all levels. You can't just start, you know, a team level. You can't start at squad. Mm. You have to be able to change that ladder of leadership at every level of the organization. So you need to have it with senior leaders, execs. Yeah. They need to be able to have that similar conversations and, and a similar language. Um, and then that gets fostered amongst an organization. But it's, it is a large topic. So giving you a, a fundamentally uh, an answer that covers everything is going to be tricky. But yeah. essentially, it's important that it happens throughout an organization, not just in a silo. Yeah. yeah. And um, so from, from Luke's talk, James, did you have any points or, or questions you'd, you'd like to, to, to ask, it, ask um, Luke based on his talk? So I was fascinated, actually, as you were going through, Luke, at, at the similarities of your talk and, mm. and intent-based leadership. They, they seem to share a huge amount. And especially, and I, I have to say, I've ne I have never seen that film, but it's now on my, uh, the top of my watch list. Um, but the, I think that was a great slide to end on um, mm. with the, the points you highlighted, because that really is fundamental to, to Agile, to IBL, and, and to decision-making. Mm. So, no, I thought it was a great talk. Thank you. Yeah. Um, so we'll, we'll finish off with um, just a few quick questions from, from, from the audience. So we've got um, Moray, who, who, who says, um, great job, guys. Um, so a question for, for, for Luke. What's the biggest barrier to making decisions in your experience? And if you could fix one thing, what would it be? Um, that's a great. Uh, thanks, Moray. Yeah, it's good to hear from you. I used to work with Moray once upon a time. So it's good to find We only connected again because of his talk. So that's quite nice. Um, I actually think the biggest one is people forgetting. I generally think it's the biggest thing, and I think that's one reason why I talk about visualizing them. Um, I think it's so easy to think we've got this big decision to make, and you just put it out of your mind, you know, because we tend to visualize other things we've got to do, but not decisions, right? We tend to not write them down. Um, so I think it's, and maybe we're forgetting them on purpose, right? There could be some malicious intent there. But honestly, I think the biggest thing is just get things written down. Uh, one of my assumptions I try and make myself is that I'm an idiot. So I write everything down because I assume I will forget. Right. I mean, most of the times I don't, but my general assumption is that I will. So get everything down. <laughs> right. And just but keep also going back to it, because if, you know, you keep like, I need a decision on this. Right. If you only ask them once every three months, right, they're not going to make a decision for you. Right. Sadly, sadly, not unless, you know, they're hyperproductive, you know. Um, so just keep having it better and be like, hey, do you remember this thing? It's here. You can see it every day. You've got to make this decision. Every time they come in, you know, look at look at the work they've got to do. And like, oh, yeah, I've got to make that. Decision. I'm holding everybody up. It's costing us money. <laughs> and uh, last last question, and I suppose that this can um, re relate to, to both of you, and it'd be good to, to get your opinion on, on this. So, um, so one person asked, I found many of these principles require a certain level of maturity from those involved, and how would you recommend dealing um, with people with low levels of, of EQ and or maturity. So we'll, we'll go with um, James. Um, I'll, I'll let you tackle that, that question first and, and what's your thoughts on this? I completely agree. It's a, it is a tricky one. I mean, going back to one of my slides, which was the, you know, the ladders that we looked at, both manager and worker. If we, if we consider that, if we assess where someone is on that ladder, we can then start to tailor our conversation, our language about how we ask them questions or, or what we expect from them in terms of decision making. So assessing where they are and then helping them grow to the next level or, or rung of the ladder really helps with uh, ascertaining where someone is on their journey. But you're right, it, it's not everyone is going to be at the top level to start with. You, you need to work out where people are at and tailor the conversation and language around that. Cool. And, and um, what do you think, Luke? Um, I think it's always, until you've got to that point, I think you kind of just have to work on the fundamentals um, sadly, kind of gradually getting these things, gradually getting people to give up a bit of responsibility, um, create, you know, I find until you get things to be further along, right, you don't want to keep adding too much on top, right? Yeah, I mean, you can put as much cream on the cake as you want, but if the cake's terrible to begin with, right, you're in trouble. So I think with all these things, take it slow, right? And I think, I think if you try and you know, go too fast, you'll kind of break it and you'll revert back. So I kind of think just think about, you know, even just your agile team, Right, so everyone is picking up the work they want. So, you know, always think about, okay, we've got a pull model, we haven't got a push model, right? So we want people to be pulling the work they want to work on and they have the skills to work on, rather than just someone in the middle being like, you do this, you do this, you do this, 
right? So kind of just start at that basic fundamental team level and then prove it works. And hopefully you can gradually expand that out and just gradually change people's thinking. You know, kind of, I try and it, was, it sounds depressing, but I was always trying to think of some of this stuff like a change. It's a bit like a boa constrictor, mm -hmm. you know? So you kind of squeeze them and you get a little bit of change. But then you give them a little bit of breathing space and you squeeze them a little bit more and just kind of gradually alter how they work. Right. Well, I, I think it, it, I'd like to obviously um, thank you. Thank you both for, for, for giving up your, your time this, this evening. Um, it's been really informative and really good hearing about intent based leadership and, and also um, de decision making as well, or, or there of lack of it. Um, so, yeah, I'd like to obviously thank you for uh, the audience for um, for um, watching and, and participating. And obviously, thank you to, to James and Luke for, for giving up their time um, this, this Thursday. And um, I'd also in, invite you. If, if you haven't done so already to, to join our um, Slack group, which um, my colleague um, Beth will, will post in, in the comment section. But yeah, from 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 Luke, from from James, and obviously from from myself, um, big big thank you to to everybody who's watched today, and of course again a big thank you to James and Luke for giving up their time. So yeah, um, I hope you all have a good evening, and um, yeah, um, do do connect with with these guys on on LinkedIn, and I'm sure they'll be happy to, to keep the the conversation going from there. So from from my Myself and, and from Luke and from James, have a good evening. Thanks a lot, everybody. Goodbye. Yeah, thanks all. Really appreciate your time.